All right. Well, the clock just struck noon Eastern time, so we're going to get started. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, always appreciate everyone taking some time out of their day to join us on these webinars and our spring webinar series. Um, we're going to dive right into it today. So today we're going to be talking about um, Eastern United States scale insects. Again, depending upon how you view the Eastern United States, it could be uh, east of the Mississippi, could be east of the Rocky Mountains, but uh, we got a, a lot of scale insects uh, that cover the east. So we're going to cover um, some of the ones that um, I find most often and some of the ones that we get a lot of calls about. If we don't cover your favorite scale insect today, I apologize, but always feel free to reach out. Uh, with that being said, let's do our quick safety brief here. So again, check your surroundings for any trip hazards, check for any um, you know inclement weather that may be in the forecast. Uh, I know some, uh, some of us in some parts of the country here on the East Coast might be getting snow, uh, so please do be careful there. And then, of course, if you are in your vehicle, please be parked in, in a safe location. Uh, please do, again, just be aware of your surroundings. Uh, some housekeeping slides today, of course. Um, if you have a question, <clears throat> please put it into the question and answer box. Uh, I believe chat is turned off again. I apologize for that. But if you have a question, put it into the question and answer box. With any time we have left over today, uh, we're going to we're gonna dig into those questions. Uh, you can always reach out afterwards as well. Um, this uh, webinar is being recorded, and so a link will be sent out afterwards. And then finally, this webinar is worth one ISA CEU. If you did not, Put your CEU number in when you registered, please put that into the question and answer box now. That's the easiest way to find that. If you did put it in when you did register, don't worry about it. We got it. But if you didn't, put it in now and uh, we'll capture that um, and we'll make sure you get your CEU. All right, real quick. So who I am, my name is Patrick Anderson. I'm the director of research and arborologist here at Rainbow. I've been at Rainbow for almost 10 years. Um, it's been a blast. My job is to provide uh, training and technical support for um, the arboricultural and horticultural industry. Um, you can see here some of my credentials. I've um, been in the industry for over 20 years now, um, and it's just, well, it's a blast to, to be in the industry, to be talking to you, and to, to work at Rainbow. Um, real quick, a little bit about Rainbow. I'm sure you've all heard of us at this point because you're here, um, but we fancy ourselves a uh, plant healthcare research and supply company. So here are just three numbers that I um, really resonate with here um, that I think explain Rainbow. Uh, 1,200 being the average number of uh, tree and landscape technical support calls we take per year. And those are just the ones that we record. I mean, this is probably multiples of this, but these are the ones that actually come into our solution center line that we actually, uh, we take the time to record. Um, 150 is the average number of unique research trials we do in any given year. Um, research and science is the backbone of what we do here at Rainbow. So everything we talk about is going to be based in some type of uh, replicated research. If it's an opinion I'm going to give, I'm going to let you know. Uh, but that's what we're talking about here is, is research. And then finally, um, eight is the number of values that we align to here at Rainbow. Um, and the first two, science-based and honesty and integrity, I think really uh, speak a lot to what we're doing here. So with all that being said, Let's dig into what we're talking about today. And that, of course, is scale insects. Again, this is one of these compressed webinars. We only have in half an hour today. So, um, gosh, there's just so much to talk about. So we're going to get as much as we can in here in a half an hour. And um, hopefully I'll learn something and take something away. But today we're going to talk about what are scale insects, a little bit how they impact uh, the landscape and plants themselves. We're going to talk about common ones we find in the east. And again, as we just mentioned, the east is a uh, eastern U.S. That's a it's a big part of the country. So we're going to try to hit on things everywhere from Maine to to Florida here. So we're going to we're going to paint with a big wide brush. Uh, so if I miss something, just reach out. I'm happy to talk more. Uh, we're going to talk more about treatment protocols and next steps. Uh, you're going to see a lot of repeat here if you watched our western scale insect um, webinar last week. You're gonna see some 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 crossover here, so uh, bear with us if you were there last week. If not, well then get ready to enjoy learning a little bit about scales. So before we even talk about common scales, let's first define what is a scale insect. So what are scale insects? Well, again, obviously they're animals, uh, they're arthropods, they're insects, but this is really where we start tying in what is a scale compared to some of these other things. Well. They're in the Hemoptera order. So they are piercing and sucking insects. That's what they are. Uh, they're related to many other piercing and sucking insects. All these piercing and sucking insects that we deal with in the landscape can be lumped into this one order. And those would include things like 
leafhoppers, true bugs, cicadas, aphids, white flies, our spot and lantern fly, if you uh, attended that webinar uh, a few weeks back, these are all um, in this pier piercing and sucking um, insect order. And so when we talk about treatment strategies, you'll notice that a lot of these treatment strategies are very similar. But what characterizes a scale insect compared to some of these other insects is really this um, second bullet point, and that is that they're highly modified, specifically the adult females, usually lack wings, legs, or any segmentation. And we'll look at some close-ups of some of these females. I describe them as kind of like these like kind of uh, round goo bags that just kind of suck and lay eggs. That's kind of what these adult females do. Uh, really interesting. And the other interesting thing about these scale insects is that, you know, the majority of their life is really sedentary. Uh, they're often just kind of uh, sitting someplace on a plant, plugged in, uh, sucking juices out of it. Um, so just really interesting insects um, and can be a challenge to manage, which is why we're talking about them here today. Uh, there are 30 or so scale insect families, but if we start kind of digging in into the scale insect families that cause damage, um, there's really seven scale insect families that we run into in the landscape. And even from that aspect, we're going to lump these into two broad categories, and those are the soft scales and the armored scales. So if we look here, we have a lot of different um, families that fall into the soft scale category, but they kind of behave the same and they feed the same, and we're going to dig into that. Um, the other scale families that we're going to be dealing with and looking at these kind of clumping these into high level are the armored scales. Also, people call them hard scales. Um, and so we're going to dig into the differences here between these two scale families. Really, like I said, we're going to lump them into soft scales and armored scales. But no, again, there's a little nuance to that. So let's just talk real quick. What are soft scales? We're going to begin with the soft scale uh, group of scale insects here. Let's do a quick time check for us. Um, <clears throat> so soft scales, again, generally they're going to be the larger of the two. They're going to be about a quarter of an inch or larger. And we're talking about the adult females is really what we're talking about here. And when we say scale insect, a lot of us, what we're thinking of, what I think of is this right here, right? So if, oh, pardon me, getting ahead of ourselves here. If we're looking at this, um, this raised round bump here. This is the adult female scale. And she gets her name. They get their name because they form this protective coating over themselves. Um, and so for soft scales, this coating is actually like attached to them. It's Think of it as kind of a part of their skin. It's really good at though at repelling um, uh, the elements and keeping them safe. So this protective shell that they create. Um, but going back to like the soft scales, again, they're, they're generally larger. They're going to be smooth, cottony around. This is a lacanium scale. We'll talk just a bit about this, but you can see how it's kind of smooth uh, and round. They feed on the phloem. So they feed on the sap. So the, the photosynthase, the carbohydrates that are being produced in the leaves and sent back down to the phloem, that's where they're feeding. And because of that, they produce a lot of sticky honeydew. We'll talk about that. Um, from a life cycle standpoint, they lay hundreds to thousands of eggs. Generally, they're going to have one generation a year. And we talk about management, knowing when that um, young generation is crawling or walking around is going to be really important. And most overwinter as nymphs. This is important, too. And we talk about how we can manage some of these things. Real quick, looking at a, a generalized life cycle, lacanium scale, as we have here, uh, is a great example of a general soft scale life cycle. So as we mentioned, they're going to overwinter as the second instar. So they're going to be small, kind of elongate and flat, really hard to see with the naked eye. You can see them with a 10 inch hand lens. At some point in time in the spring, they're going to start to mature. They're going to kind of start plumping up. They're going to start feeding on that sap. They're going to kind of plump up. They're going to turn into what we recognize as scale insects here. So this is an example here. You can see this uh, mature female scale. It has that um, coating over it. Um, again, no legs, no arms, no antenna, just kind of the goo blob that's feeding on the tree. Um, she will eventually um, lay her eggs. Those eggs will then hatch often with our soft scales, and we'll see some exceptions, often sometime in the spring, these eggs will hatch. And this is her first instar. We call these the crawlers. They can actually move out onto new feeding sites. And a lot of our soft scales, what they'll do is they'll crawl onto leaves, and then they'll settle down and they'll feed on those leaves all summer long until the fall. And then at some point in time, they will molt and they'll crawl back down onto those twigs where they're going to um, resume their life cycle. 
So I mentioned um, scale crawlers. So this is how small they are. This is what these crawlers look like once they hatch. Uh, and again, we can have hundreds to thousands of these things crawling around looking for new feeding sites. This is a magnolia scale crawler right here. Um, and some people get the heebie-jeebies. I think they're kind of cute, but hey, that's, that is, that's what we're talking about when we talk about scale crawlers. And when we talk about management, this is the phase that we're targeting here, these scale crawlers. So let's talk a little bit now about um, the difference of soft scales, where they feed. That's the big thing with our soft scales. And this is when we talk about management, a big thing of uh, how we're managing them, is where they feed. And then when we talk about the symptoms and damage, a lot of it has to come down to where they feed. So our soft scale is going to crawl, going to find a nice place to settle down. It's going to drop its feeding apparatus down through the leaf causing some damage to cells there, but what it's really going to start doing is going to feeding in this vascular bundle. So this is where all that nice stuff that's being produced in the leaves are coming down into the tree. That's where it's feeding, but it's a siphon. It's siphoning it. It's not like kind of, you know, sucking it up and swallowing and, and drinking more and swallowing. It's a siphon. So anything that it can't produce at that time is going to come out of its rear end as this sooty mold or this honeydew rather, this sticky honey mold substance. And this is a key distinguishing factor when you're wondering what kind of scale you're dealing with. If it's producing a lot of this honeydew, then you know you're dealing with a soft scale. So this is what we see here is we see all this stuff coming out of the plant, or excuse me, coming out of the scale. That, of course, that um, sooty mold will grow on. And this will cover everything underneath it. So that honeydew will cover other plants. It'll cover uh, driveways. It'll cover chairs and cards, what have you. And this sooty mold, if not washed off, will grow on it. And of course, this is just a big aesthetic issue here. So those are our soft scales. Let's just kind of look at some of our most common soft scales that we run into out there in the landscape. Uh, we already talked about lacanium scale. Um, there's a lot of different species of lacanium scale. We just kind of group them all into this kind of generalized term lacanium scale. They can affect a lot of different plant species. Uh, we often find them on oaks, specifically oaks in the red oak group, things like willow oak, um, pin oak, uh, northern red oak, we see them on those. But they can also get on things like dogwoods and red buds, see them a lot on those species as well. From a crawler standpoint, when we talk about treatment, our treatments are always gonna kind of be based around this crawler phase. One is, as you saw in that video, they're small, they're delicate. If you're gonna use a foliar application or a spray application, super easy to kill at this point in time. Likewise, if you're doing a systemic application, um, smaller pests take less product to ingest before they perish. So if we can get systemics up into the plant and get them right around the time they're settling down to eat, we're gonna be um, have a much higher likelihood of causing mortality across that population. So that's gonna be really important. We use growing degree days and phenology as a way uh, to time out when these things are going to be hatching. So with our lacanium scales, generally speaking, we're going to start seeing crawler emergence from 700 growing degree days up to 1600 growing degree days. This is often going to be like May, June timeframe, depending upon where you are in the country. This also will coincide with northern Catalpa blooming. So if you're walking around and you see that northern Catalpa bloom, that's the key to, hey, if I'm trying to manage lacanium scale, this is the time to start monitoring for those scales. Fletcher scale is very closely related to lacanium scale. You see it's in the same genus here. The difference here is Fletcher scale we find really on um, our conifer species, things like arborvitae, yew, Taxis, and what I've seen a lot here, specifically in the southeast, is on bald cypress. Bald cypress seems to be becoming more and more popularly planted in landscapes and heavy commercial landscapes with a lot of reflected heat. And I'm seeing this more and more on these bald cypress. They plant them there because they're they're a tough tree. They can take a lot of that kind of reflected heat and poor uh, drain, poorly drained soils and compacted soils. But they seem to become a magnet for this Fletcher scale. So something to be on on the lookout for, and again, reported at about 957 growing degree days for those crawlers. Another one we find really commonly throughout the country is this cottony maple scale. There's cottony maple scale, there's cottony maple leaf scale, very common, um, very closely related. Um, again here, getting that name because you can see that their egg sacs, their ova sacs, are this kind of cottony material, hence cottony maple scale, often found on maples, but of course also can be found on honey locust, linden, I see them on dogwoods all the time, a lot of different hardwoods, see them on um, elms as well. 
Um, again, crawlers emerge here about 800 growing degree days. So you can see with these soft scales, they're all kind of coming out around the same time. Another closely related one that we see um, really down here in the southeast as well is this cottony camellia scale. We find it on camellias, of course. We also see it on these broader leaf hollies like our Burford and Foster hollies. And you can see here from the growing degree day standpoint, 800 to 1300 growing degree days there. Um, the last two we're gonna cover are very closely related. And these are exceptions to the rules uh, here is that they crawl in the fall or late summer. Magnolia scale. Now, this is a huge issue for a lot of people, specifically up in more of the northern eastern states. Uh, so again, in uh, the northeast, Massachusetts, places like that, uh, Minnesota, uh, Illinois, these types of places, they have we have huge issues with magnolia scale. These are interesting because um, with a lot of our soft scale insects, part of their life phase will actually crawl out there onto the leaves. These never crawl onto the leaves, which makes kind of getting systemics to them a little bit harder. Um, and again, going back to this is they crawl later on in the season. You look at that growing degree day activity, uh, about 2,100 to 28 growing degree days. So much later on. So if we're using um, some of our folder applications, like our insect growth regulators that work just phenomenally on a, pro a, a pest like this, we got to be spraying later on in the year. Uh, so it's a little change in our operations, but big, big, nasty scale. Uh, this can cause decline of the plants. Another closely rated one, this is one we see more probably in the southern states, is tulip tree scale. Often confused, um, very closely related. But again, you can see as far as uh, the crawlers here, we're going to be crawling later on in the year. Um, these are going to be often found on tulip poplar, of course, but also magnolia, a lot of our flower magnolias. And again, magnolia, things like um, magnolia virginiana. Uh, are getting more and more popularly planted in these urban landscapes. And so we see more of these scales in the landscapes there. And you can see my note here, if you're in a place like Florida, you have all, all life stages all year long. Okay, for real, my last soft scale is, is technically a felty scale, but it's one that we're seeing throughout the mid-Atlantic and Southeast. And this is crepe myrtle bark scale. This is a relatively new scale to the United States. Um, as it, you might imagine, because it's on crepe myrtle, it is an imported scale. It really loves crepe myrtle, but it can also get on American beautyberry, which is a native understory shrub. Um, and that's a real shame because it's a beautiful plant. It's a native and um, hopefully this doesn't have a huge ecological impact, but it can complete its life cycle on there. There is still research being done on the life cycle of crepe myrtle bark scale. Um, Suffice it to say, though, you can find crawlers almost all year long on this. It seems to have overlapping generations. Uh, there seems to be spikes in the generations in the fall and then again in the spring. Um, but my colleagues here in North Carolina found crawlers in December in Charlotte. So um, still learning the phenology, the grown degree day, the life cycle of this. But um, this is one that can be um, can be difficult at time the crawler emergence on. However, some of our systemics like TransTech work just really, really well on it. So let's move away now from our soft scales into our armored scales. So in contrast to our soft scales, our armored scales are going to be a little bit smaller. They're going to be about uh, an eighth of an inch long. Um, they're going to have a waxy shell that's not attached to their body. So you can pop that shell off and the scale insect will be attached to the tree still. With soft scales, if you pull that shell off, that insect's gonna come with the shell. So that's one way to tell the difference between the two. Um, in this case here, uh, there's gonna be several generations per year or they're gonna have a really long um, uh, hatching period. So this is another thing. When we talk about armored scales, it becomes a little bit more difficult to manage these because of the fact that they have a longer life phase or they have multiple life phases. Um, and here's the other thing is people always wonder about this is um, we don't see honeydew with these, and we'll see why here in a second. But people ask, well, where does their where does their excrement go? Well, they regurgitate their excrement back up through their mouth into the plant, which also causes toxicity to the plant. So that's another way they cause damage to these trees. Now, where they're feeding is different. So remember our soft scales over here um, siphoning in this vascular bundle. Our armored scales are cell busters. They're actually feeding in cells, causing damage that way. And when we think about a plant health standpoint. It's easier for a plant to, to um, replace like the sap that these soft scales are uh, feeding on versus replacing whole cells. So when we think about a plant health standpoint, we often think of armored scales being a bigger health threat to trees because it just takes more resources to build a cell than it does to kind of replace some of that sap. 
Um, this is what it looks like when you have them feeding on the leaves. You start seeing this chlorosis that then kind of coalesces, and you can see that whole leaf turn yellow and fall off. And this is what happens when we have high populations of this scale insect. Here you can see a bunch of trees that are beginning to leaf out, and that one tree that's not leafing out has a very high population of the scale we're about to talk about, which is gloomy scale. So gloomy scale is an armored scale. We find it throughout the, um, really throughout the East Coast, up into maybe um, southeastern Pennsylvania, but certainly down through the southeast uh, in the Mid-Atlantic states. Um, this has one generation a year, but it crawls over an eight-week period. Uh, from a phenology standpoint, they begin to emerge about eight weeks after full leaf out of red maple, or about 1,500 growing degree days, and are really commonly found on red maple in commercial landscapes or heavily urbanized landscapes. That's where you find them a lot. And then you can see the close-up there of the female uh, with her little uh, crawlers coming out again, just little round goo bags. Another one that we find, armored scale, that we find really often is this pine needle scale, uh, found really anywhere pine trees are grown. Um, it's a native pest, um, but it can really do damage uh, to introduced pines. You can also find it on um, spruces, Douglas firs, and um, cedars. It causes needle chlorosis and premature needle drop. It also just doesn't really look good from a distance. It looks like these trees have been turned white in high populations. Has two overlapping generations a year. You can see that first generation is coming out in early spring, coinciding with full bloom of bridal wreath spirea. Oyster shell scale is another one we see all over um, the entire country and, and really especially in the East Coast here. Uh, one generation a year has a huge host range beam ash, dogwood, maple, elm. Um, one generation per year, as I mentioned, um, coincides with a full bloom of uh, red buckeye. So if you see those blooming, you know you have this guy out there on, on your plants. We also have a long at hemlock scale, uh, found anywhere, um, a lot of places that hemlocks are growing. And this range is also expanding western into the where we have hemlocks as well. Uh, two generations a year. Uh, we can find it on other species outside of hemlock, uh, but this also may coincide with um, hemlock woolly adelgid, so being like a one-two punch for some of these poor hemlocks out there. Uh, and again, you can see the growing degree days listed here. I know I'm going a little fast. If you want any of these slides, if you want any of this information on growing degree days, please just email me. I am always happy to share this stuff. Um, wrapping up here, we have two more armored scales we're going to cover over on. One is white prunicola scale, or um, very closely related species is white peach scale. They're really closely related. Uh, you have to get out a microscope and really be an expert to tell the difference between the two. There is contradictory information on what species they prefer or where they are, so we're just going to keep it at white prunicola scale for this conversation. Um, Suffice it to say, it gets on a lot of our prunus species, peach, plum, cherry. Uh, we'll also find it on mulberry, lilac, and privet as well, often on these plants. This can cause severe dieback. This is one of these scales that alone by itself, it can cause dieback of the tree. Has two to three generations a year, depending upon where you are in the country. Um, can be a real tough one to manage here. And then our last one, oh, two more, sorry. Second to last one is Japanese maple scale. This one is becoming um, more common in uh, landscapes. Find it coming in in a lot of different plant material uh, that's coming from nurseries. Uh, again, we find it on Japanese maple. Find it a lot on dogwoods, believe it or not, coming from nurseries. Has two overlapping generations a year. Um, and you can see there, the, the first generation coincides with um, oak leaf, hydrangea flower, or smoke bush flowering. And our last one, this is really just for our southeasterners here, um, is this false oleander scale. We find this um, everywhere, specifically on southern magnolia. This one has multiple over gener lapping generations a year, uh, having to do, of course, with where it's growing. This is really growing in a lot of our um, warmer areas, um, coastal climates in uh, North Carolina down through Florida. So real quick to some of these additional resources, where can you find information on this stuff? We can always email Rainbow, we're always happy to share this. Um, but there's a lot of different um, resources out there that will give you information on growing degree days and phenology. This is University of Maryland's Pest Predictive Calendar. You can simply Google that, universe, UMD Pest Predictive Calendar, and you'll get this. It's really cool because it will give you information around what is flowering or what is blooming, and then when these pests are becoming active, cross-reference with growing degree days. 
Uh, there's also some tools that you can use to calculate your own growing degree days. Uh, the National Phenology Network has a really neat uh, visualization tool. And then a colleague of mine is working with uh, one of his colleagues to create this tool called the Degree Day Dashboard. So if you go to degreedaydashboard.com, it's really intuitive. You put in your zip code, it finds the closest weather station to you, and then it gives you your growing degree days, both for the day and you can see what they were for the year. All right. Now, I'm sure what everyone was waiting for, and as we kind of bring it all home, is our treatment options. So we have these idealized treatment options based upon the type of pest that you're dealing with. Now, as we mentioned, every different scale has kind of a, a unique life phase. So all of these are usually going to be tied up with when those crawlers are happening. But if we look at some generalizations, generally speaking, most of our soft scales, the crawlers are coming out in the spring. So we can use things like our insect growth regulator, like Proxite, which I really, really like. Proxide is an, um, it's a juvenile hormone mimic. So when these crawlers come in contact with it, they can't molt so that light phase is broken. It's considered reduced risk. So it's a great product. It is foliar sprayed, um, but it's a great product to use in reduced risk situation. Plants that are in flower when you're trying to make this application, this is a great product for that. Uh, and it's a great thing to tell your clients that you're using a reduced risk product. It's not a true insecticide. It's an insect growth regulator. We, of course, have things like TransTech, which is Dinotetrian. Just so much data on how well this works on scale insects can really be the cornerstone of any scale management um, protocol. Moves really fast in the plant as a systemic, as a soil application, or as a lower systemic bark spray. Gets in the plant within seven days or so, goes to work to uh, get mortality, can really work well. We have a trunk injected formulation uh, of this. And then of course we also have Zytec, which is a metacloprid, which can be applied uh, as a preventative either in the early spring or in the fall to get full season control on soft scales. And then of course, horticultural oil, commonly used in a lot of these things as well. We can use this um, often used as a dormant spray to get those overwintering nips. It's a great tool for that. Now, moving away from that soft scale to that armored scale. Now, one thing I want you to note on this armored scale is that we take Zytec off the list, the midocloprid off the list. And the reason for that is, remember where these scales are feeding and remember how systemic pesticides work. That soft scale is feeding in that vascular bundle and midocloprid is coming right up in that vascular bundle and killing those scales, just like TransTech would. But TransTech, because of the, um, the water solubility of it and a few other factors, it will actually move over into that tissue where those armored scales are feeding. Zytec won't do that. So for armored scales, we take Zytec off our list and we implant TransTec, um, or we just rely on TransTec by itself. Very, very effective. All these are just as effective here as they were with our soft scale insects. Highlight this bark spray application of TransTec. This is a very fast and effective way to apply um, Dinotepuran. You're just spraying the, um, the lower trunk of the bark from about five feet down on the root flare, getting just spray to drip coverage. And again, it's just, it's super effective, it's super fast. And if you're managing a lot of trees is something I would encourage you to look into. And of course, I'm a sucker for data. So if we're gonna look at bark sprays of dinotefuran compared to um, sprays of pyroproxima, that's our proxite product, compared to untreated controls, this is on gloomy scale, we see that we get great results using these active ingredients in these methods. So this is a great way to manage these things. This is research work done um, by uh, some of our colleagues here at uh, the Bartlett Tree Research Lab. So thanks, thanks for sharing that. Wrapping it all up, and I'll stay on for any additional questions if y'all wanna stay on with me, but you know, again, we're gonna be wrapping up here at the half an hour. Um, we have some additional benefits here at Rainbow that is, you know, tech support, training, and our e-learning platforms. Stay, stay tuned to see more about this stuff. And we always appreciate you coming out and, uh, and being with us on these webinars. And then finally, we have a lot of resources around scale management. We have our scale management guide. We have um, specific scale management treatment guides for parts of the country. This kind of breaks down what scales you might run into. And then looking at these different protocols, times them up with the life cycle of that scale. So that's available to you as well. Please feel free to reach out. This is my information. Uh, if any additional questions or anything, please again, feel free to reach out in any way you feel uh, confident. That concludes the presentation part of the webinar. If you've stayed here this long, you will get your CEU. Um, I'll look to see if there's any questions though. Um, bear with me here. Uh, we have quite a few folks that put in their ISACU number. We appreciate that.
We have one here, do soft scales only feed on leaves or do they feed on branches and stems too? It's a great question. So uh, again, it's gonna depend upon the species. Things like Lacanium scale, um, most of them are gonna migrate out to leaves. You will get some that are gonna hang out on twigs for sure. If they find a place they wanna hang out and feed, they're gonna stay there. Um, but a lot of these are gonna migrate out to the leaves and then migrate back down to the stem at some point in time. So depends upon the species. Um, in contrast, of course, as we mentioned, things like magnolia scale and tulip tree scale, they almost never move out onto the leaves on deciduous plants. Um, so, you know, especially if you're um, in the Northeast or in the upper Midwest, these, um, these uh, magnolia scales will likely not move out on the leaves. Some may, and of course, they'll fall off and then they'll die because they fell off. Um, but the ones that survive are going to stay on the stems. Um, now, in contrast, in places like Florida or in coastal parts of the Carolinas and Georgia, uh, where we have southern magnolias, um, they will the tulip tree scale will migrate out onto that that leaf tissue and stay. It's a little bit different though, because again, they are indeed um, evergreen in that case. Another question here is how far north has crepe myrtle bark scale been reported? Um, as best as I know, now again, I would say, you know, definitely double check me on this, but you know, you're in Northern Virginia right now. Um, oh, I don't know if it has been reported in Delaware or not, but certainly in Maryland, DC, um, it's it's there and it's there in pretty high, high numbers, but you might want to double check and I can double check that for you too. Um, question your info on juniper scale. Um, Anonymous, you're an anonymous attendee, so I can't get back to you, but uh, we can talk more about Juniper Scale. If you want to reach out to me, I can get you information on, on Juniper Scale for sure. It's an armored scale. Um, so again, things like TransTech will work really, really well on it. Um, I don't remember the, the uh, crawler's uh, degree days or anything like that off the top of my head. Um, so the question here is, what is the email? So we can request the slides. If you're still on anonymous attendee, my email is right there, panderson at rainbowecosigns.com. I'm super happy to share that with you. Uh, let's see here. Anything else? Any OMRI recommendations? So that's a good question here too. So OMRI, of course, is the Organic Materials Research Institute. They would essentially certify a product as, as organic. So if you wanted to promote that you had an organic program or if you were doing organic farming, you would need to use a product that had that OMRI seal. Um, and so for OMRI things, there are um, there are OMRI labeled horticultural oils. Um, there's OMRI labeled insecticidal soaps. These would all work really well on that crawler phase. So if you can time these at crawler phase, those are going to work really, really well. Now, of course, you have to get really good coverage. You have to cover the entire insect for it to actually perish. So that's a downside of using some of those foliars. Um, we didn't discuss the pyrethrins for several reasons. Um, due to the fact that you know these pyrethrins will kill all insects with, that they come in contact with, including the beneficial insects. And so when you use things like um, the pyrethrins, you can actually induce um, uh, scale outbreaks as well as spider mite outbreaks. So we usually don't discuss those in these, but there are OMRI listed pyrethrins as well. So that would be something else you could use on those crawlers. Uh, here it says tree injection is a good solution on trees. So tree injection here, um, or we'd recommend tree injection for uh, scale insects would be, have to do with the site really, and then the size of the tree. If you're on a sensitive site, uh, ooh, let's say you're using, um, you're trying to manage elongated hemlock scale on hemlocks that are growing right next to a mountain stream, you know, five feet away from a mountain stream, and you need to manage these insects, that would be a great application using this trunk injection of uh, dinotepturan. Uh, another reason to use trunk injection would be if you have a very, very large tree and you have an active infestation of scale, something like maybe a lacanium scale where it's just raining down honeydew and maybe just disrupting somebody's, um, like their, their, their habitat, right? Maybe it's a wedding venue and they can't have honeydew raining down. Doing a trunk injection on a large tree will get you really, really fast results. And we see really great distribution when we do those trunk injections. So those are reasons why you might use a tree injection uh, on some of these trees. Oh, another question here, how about Lepitect on soft scale? So Lepitect is a soil applied acephate. Um, it is another great product for soft scales. Uh, it works really well on a lot of our piercing and sucking insects. Uh, so if you had your timing right, you could definitely use Lepitect. The downside, of course, is it only has about a 30 to 45 day residual. So you have to make sure um, it's matched up really well to the timing of that pest. But Lepitect for soft scales would work really well also. Good question. 
Another question here, do you prefer to apply Transtech as a bark spray or soil injection and why? Um, so I personally prefer to do, well, again, it's going to depend upon the size of the tree. If I have a single trunk that I can get to, I prefer to use the bark spray application. Um, it's just really fast and easy, in my opinion. Um, however, if it was like a multi-stem tree or, you know, a shrub or a tree that maybe I couldn't get to the bark, you know, maybe it's a conifer of some kind that has branches all the way down, um, then I would go over to the soil injection. Um, I can say in commercial landscapes where let's say you have just a lot of trees in a row that you're treating for a scale. I've personally treated over 40 trees in an hour using that bark spray rate, really fast, really effective. Um, so it's a good way to do it depending upon your situation. A uh, question here about how many years of control. Um, I'm not sure exactly um, the context behind this, but uh, if you're trying to manage scales, uh, depending upon the population, um, you know, after one season, depending upon the population, you might have it to the point where you're just monitoring that infestation. If it's a large infestation, especially on some of these armored scales, it might take a several consecutive years to get that population to the point where you don't need to treat and you're just in that monitoring phase. Um, for these other products, though, if you look at something like a or Zytec, that should give you about 12 months of control. Dynatefuran, Transtec, that's going to give you um, anywhere from three to six months of control. And then finally, um, your pyro, the pyroproxifen that we talked about, the proxite, that's going to give you about 28 days of control. So not sure the context on that, but hopefully I, hopefully I hit it in that answer. Um, all right, so thanks for the armory recommendations. No problem. Thanks you for being here. And then the question here is the smallest caliper you would inject. So when we talk about injection, we don't even, we're not thinking about caliper. Caliper is a measurement of diameter from six to 12 inches above the ground. So we're talking about like true diameter. Um, so we really wouldn't want to inject anything that's smaller than four inches in diameter at, and when I say diameter, I mean diameter at standard height or diameter at breast height or diameter measured at four and a half feet above the ground. So a four inch tree measured at about four and a half feet above the ground is, that, that's about the biggest tree we would want to, want to inject. Well, thank you, everybody. I think that is all the questions. I know we are over time. Oh, only by six minutes, so not too bad. Um, if you're still on, thank you so much for being here. Um, please let us know if you have any additional questions, and um, just have a great rest of your day, and we will see you all soon. Bye.